Hello and welcome to The Light. Today, we're diving into one of the most legendary stories in the history of mathematics, a uh, tale of a simple note in a book margin that baffled the world's greatest minds for over 350 years. This is the story of Fermat's last theorem. It all begins in the 17th century with a French lawyer and amateur mathematician named Pierre de Fermat. Fermat wasn't a professional academic. Mathematics was his passion, his hobby. He loved reading ancient texts, especially Diophantus's Arithmetica, a classic book on number theory. As he studied, he'd often scribble notes in the margins, challenging himself with new ideas. One day, next to a problem about splitting a square number into two other squares, he wrote a note that would become infamous. We all know the Pythagorean theorem from school, right? A squared plus b squared equals c squared. It describes the relationship between the sides of a right-angled triangle. There are plenty of whole number solutions, like 3 plus 4 equals 5. Simple enough. But Fermat wondered, what if we change the power? What if we try to find whole number solutions for a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed, or for av v plus b equals c, or for any power higher than 2? In the margin of his book, Fermat wrote, it is impossible to separate a cube into two cubes, or a fourth power into two fourth powers, or, in general, any power higher than the second into two like powers. He then added the tantalizing sentence. I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. And that was it. No proof was ever found among his papers. For centuries, this simple statement, which came to be known as Fermat's last theorem, was a mathematical ghost haunting the world of numbers. Was Fermat telling the truth? Did he really have a proof? Or was it a brilliant bluff? Generations of mathematicians tried to crack it. Leonhard Euler, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, managed to prove the case for n equals 3 in the 18th century. But a general proof for all numbers remained elusive. The problem was so simple to state, yet so incredibly difficult to solve. The quest became a relay race across history. Sophie Germain, a brilliant female mathematician in the early 19th century, had to use a male pseudonym to even have her work read. She made a major breakthrough, developing a new approach that proved the theorem for a large class of prime numbers. Her work was a giant leap forward. Then, in the mid-19th century, Ernst Kammer developed sophisticated new tools in number theory, believing he had solved it. He hadn't, but his ideal numbers opened up entire new fields of mathematics, all in the pursuit of Fermat's riddle. But still no complete proof. The theorem became a legend, a white whale for mathematicians. It was the Mount Everest of number theory. Many believed it might be unsolvable. Fast forward to the 20th century, the world had changed. We had computers, new mathematical theories, and a renewed sense of possibility. And we had Andrew Wiles. As a 10-year-old boy in England, Wiles stumbled upon a book about Fermat's last theorem in his local library. He was captivated by the idea that a 17th century mathematician had posed a problem that no one in over 300 years could solve. It became his childhood dream to be the one to find the proof. Wiles grew up to become a distinguished professor at Princeton University. For years, he worked on other mathematical problems, but the dream of solving Fermat's last theorem never left him. In the mid-1980s, a breakthrough happened, but not from Wiles. Two Japanese mathematicians, Yutaka Taniyama and Goro Shimura, proposed a conjecture, a seemingly unrelated idea connecting two very different areas of mathematics, elliptic curves and modular forms. At first, no one saw the connection to Fermat's last theorem. But then, other mathematicians showed that if the Taniyama Shimura conjecture was true, then Fermat's last theorem must also be true. This was the moment Wiles had been waiting for. He realized this was the path. He decided to dedicate himself completely to proving the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. To avoid distractions and the pressure of public scrutiny, he made a remarkable decision. For the next seven years, he worked in secret, in the attic of his home. He told no one except his wife. Imagine the dedication, the sheer focus required to tackle such a monumental problem in complete isolation. Year after year, he chipped away at the problem, developing new techniques and combining old ones. He described the process like entering a dark, unfamiliar mansion. You go into the first room and it's dark, completely dark. You stumble around, bumping into the furniture. Gradually you learn where each piece of furniture is. 
And finally, after six months or so, you find the light switch, you turn it on, and suddenly it's all illuminated. You can see exactly where you were. Then, you move into the next room and repeat the process. Finally, in 1993, after seven years of solitary work, Wiles believed he had done it. He announced his proof in a series of lectures at Cambridge University. The mathematical world was electric with excitement. The final lecture ended with thunderous applause and flashing cameras. The 350-year-old problem was solved, or was it? During the peer review process, a flaw was found. A subtle but crucial gap in his reasoning. After seven years of intense work and a triumphant announcement, Wiles was faced with the devastating possibility that his proof was wrong. He described this period as the most difficult of his life. The pressure was immense. The entire world was watching. Wiles didn't give up. He enlisted the help of one of his former students, Richard Taylor. For another year, they worked intensely, trying to bridge the gap. They were on the verge of admitting defeat. Then, on September 19, 1994, Wiles had a sudden stunning moment of insight. He realized that the very technique that had failed him before could be modified in a way that would make the proof work perfectly. It was a eureka moment born from years of perseverance. The final corrected proof was published in 1995. It was over 100 pages long, a complex and beautiful tapestry of modern mathematics that Fermat could never have imagined. Andrew Wiles had finally conquered the Everest of number theory. He hadn't used Fermat's marvelous proof, if one ever existed. Instead, he had built a bridge between two distant continents of mathematics, proving the Taniyama Shimura conjecture and, as a result, laying Fermat's last theorem to rest. The story of Fermat's last theorem is more than just a math problem. It's a story about human curiosity, intellectual passion, and the incredible power of perseverance. It shows us how a simple question can inspire centuries of progress and how the pursuit of knowledge connects generations across time. It reminds us that even after hundreds of years of struggle, a moment of brilliant insight can change everything. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey today at The Light. If you enjoyed this story, please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss our next exploration. See you next time.